follow the lead. Okay, good. We're recording. Now, I'll just say, welcome to the Manor. And we are live broadcasting with our seniors at the Manor program. And over to Susan, our executive producer. <laughs> Hi, welcome, everyone. Glad you could make it. We have quite a um, lineup for you. We have Marie, who's going to show us about Newfoundland mittens, which we're probably going to need this winter. And then her friend Shirley will show us some more crafts. JJ is going to talk about Newfoundland, and then Oma will let us know about a little history of Bavaria. So take it away. There we go. Now, well, over to, to Marie. Now, Marie, what we probably like is you to you, you uh, the, whatever is the camera to, to be closer to your beautiful face. All right, can do. And what we're going to do, ah, since I know how to do that, one Did second, it? begin. Did it? Let me figure out how to spotlight you and spotlight for okay there you are because we want to see you okay good there we go all right look at that herself <laughs> for red isn't that great i love your kitchen isn't that we'll have to visit some <laughs> okay <laughs> anyway <clears throat> knitting i learned how to knit in elementary school in sarnia during the Second World War. Um, we were just kids, but it seemed all the young kids were being taught, even you know, younger than I, being taught how to knit because we made uh, squares for Afghans. Somebody put them uh, the squares together. Um, and my brothers learned, I have two brothers, two older brothers. They learned how to knit too at the time. Anyway, my mom didn't knit and uh, and I would take my problems to the uh, neighbor lady across the road. She was very, very handy and helpful. I remember as a teenager, I had uh, uh, socks knit for my brother, my brother's birthday. And I only had one done when his birthday came. So I told him, well, I'll finish it. It took me until the following <laughs> birthday before I got the, the pair ready. Uh, if you're interested in learning to knit, uh, I read where it's not the best idea to make a scarf. It takes too long and you soon tire of it. This article suggested trying a hat. Also, I was part of a knitting group at the local library. This is where uh, one of the ladies gave me the Newfoundland pattern for mitts. She was a big help getting me comfortable with the, with the pattern. That's the only time, and that has to be th three or more years ago. And then that's the only time that uh, anyone has known what I was talking about or has seen them even. So I don't know. Afghans are great to knit. Uh, they're usually done in sections and you uh, sew them together at the end. I've done a few of those for my kids and my grandkids. And I was neat noticing some common, common knitting terms, which I hadn't seen before. UFO, that's unfinished object. <laughs> <laughs> and frogging, frogging um, is, is supposedly, when you're ripping out the stitches, that's the, how the name became uh, it, uh, rip it, rip, rip it. <laughs> um, if you're planning um, to put in time on any project, it's worth getting good uh, material. Uh, crafts are good too because they're good keeping your uh, mind active. Um, we see a lot of merino wool, uh, and it's usually superwash now. And a lot of alpaca yarn too available. Um, the the, the uh, product is certainly a lot better than it used to be. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, it was so easy to have your mitts just shrink right up. It, you get them wet in the snow, <coughs> and then you're trying to get them dry. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <clears throat> anyway, uh, 
when you're when you're doing things like this, I find <coughs> I find it quite an accomplishment. <coughs> Dear, help us. I'm working on it. What is on the way? <coughs> oh, here we go. Thank you, dear. Um, and um, and I always felt that you could knit and watch TV, so you weren't wasting your time. Um, and I've got some things laid out uh, for you to look at. Are you going to? Sure. So maybe the best thing for me to do is like for the Afghan, let's bring it over here and I can hold it up. Maybe. Because we're going to show this, yeah? Yeah. Well, that's what I was thinking. And the other one is yeah. bigger. Oh, than that. right. This, this was done in one oh. week. But an interesting, um, now you get these variegated yarns that are lovely. We didn't used to have all of that a possibility, you know? Mm. That's a big thing. That's amazing. That is lovely. Okay. Yeah. Well, take, a look, take a look at this one because this one is a little fussier, the pattern. It's and, one color, but I don't know if you can see. Yes. Yeah. And oh, it, was done, it was done in pieces and then sewn together at the end. So it's quite large too. Yeah, it's covered. Covered so your full, full body, <coughs> full body yeah. blanket. Okay, so I'm yeah. gonna bring you guys and over. Then, and then I, I, I'll just while oh, she's right, gone right, for yeah. that, I just want to say, uh, this is the the one you're doing now. Yeah, this is the this is the one that's called the prayer shawl, and I never got around to one of these before. I was always going to, and this is a variegated too. So, the the nice part about this is the pattern is uh, uh, if you cast on 57 stitches you'll always be starting with a knit three so it's a knit three purl three knit three purl three so whenever you pick your work up you're always knowing you're going to be knitting that's great so that is the best tip i have heard in years <laughs> yeah so it's worth the, it's worth considering and it looks like it'll be nice size when you get done because it's a big ball of yarn so i'm just going to travel <coughs> over to the items that um she just wanted to show you you can be carol merrill yeah i'm carol merrill exactly <coughs> so this for this is an example of one combination of newfoundland mitten wow can you guys see that there's a raised and a lowered pattern to oh, it? Yeah. yeah. So that's what's giving you the extra um, warmth. Yes. Yeah, like it gives a lot more warmth to the mitten and a lot more thickness. So your hands don't get cold. There's other, lots of other examples. Well, look at that, my yeah, word. Really lovely. Um, Are we gonna be able to get a pattern? <laughs> you have a pattern, mom, that you can share with the group? I have. I did make a pattern. Is this it? Well, that's one of them. But I did make a pattern for uh, in case anyone was interested. Uh, I could send it when I'm sending uh, what um, John Joseph asked for. Yes, okay. I could send that pattern. Oh, yes. He, he probably can make uh, uh, the. Well, no, I, I, know people, I know people that can make them. <laughs> uh, but I, he mean, yeah. she means um, a pattern, uh, oh, like, okay. sorry, a copy, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, all right, hang on. All right, so just a second, we're just doing some Carol Merrill stuff over here. Good. How do we, how do you oh, yeah, it? we're going to put it on, all right. Ooh. Very nice, and then you hold this a oh, little bit away. Right. Um, okay, got to go farther away. Oh, farther away. Yeah, okay. That's beautiful. So this has, you can't really tell, but... Here, I'm going to turn, Mom, I'm going to get so that the light's on me, and you're going to be over there. There we go. Perfect. Yep. Okay, now I'm going to get back a bit. Whoa. Yeah, there we go. So you can see the um, the edge on this piece. Look at that. It's beautiful. Yeah. And it's, again, it's a variegated, it's really hard to tell how beautiful this is. Yes, yeah, beautiful. Um, it's, it's quite light, but it's got um, some body to it, and she sewed. Like it's a, it's intended to be asymmetric. So she sewed right. here, right? And see, it's got the beautiful, the beautiful weave on the back, and it kind of matches in with the, 
with and, the edge. It's quite and of lovely. course, Joanne's always good at modeling. All ah, right. And then, and Joanne, yeah. can, you, can you tell us what the for that or the, the well, that one, Mom, do you remember? It's not a wool, it's a very light one. Yeah, it is. I would I say, um, and I would say that this is a mix of like, it feels almost like silk and something. Yeah, yes, it could very well like be a, silk. Like a with... silk and cotton or a bamboo and cotton or something. It not, feels not cotton. Couldn't, no, couldn't, be, not cotton. couldn't be cotton. No. Maybe it's silk and wool because it's got yeah. a nice, nice, yeah. it's got a really nice bounce to it. See how it's got body? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable. This, this one's really mm -hmm. lovely. Oh, and she's done leg warmers and um, socks. I wanted to show you the super fun socks. <laughs> Aren't those a blast? Oh, yeah. Those are a big blast. Now, can you tell me for those ones, was it a specific variegated kind of wool that it is right there. knits up into that pattern? So I don't know that it, it, you're specifically knowing that you're going to get this pattern when you get this wool, but this wool is called Patton's Croy Sock Wool. This is backwards, sorry, because of the way the camera shows it. Um, Fine, that, we can read, yeah. Yeah, so Patton's Croy Socks, and then that's what you end up with. Yeah. You didn't do two. No, I, that's just, I, that's how it just went. the way it went. Yeah, yeah. so. It's, it's, a, it's got a built-in pattern, go for it. built-in pattern. And I wanted to show you a pair of socks, another pair of socks that she made, which I've worn many, many, many times. Oh my. These are super fun. <laughs> I, I love them. They fit in all of my, they're great for like, when you need some warmth, but you don't want, the, they're not picky. They're just, they're, those are really great. And then there's this. Wow. Sort of a green okay. this way. Kind of a cowl shawly number. You can kind of do all kinds of stuff with it. That was great. And then there's this, which is sort of similar to that orangey pink one, but yeah. not sewn. Yes. Right? So this one is kind of lovely you, with the mask. You could put it over your head. Yeah. <laughs> you could do, it's true. You can do all sorts of stuff, right? Yeah. Hello, nativity. <laughs> there. I'm the, I'm the virgin again. Here we go. Okay. And then there's my pièce de résistance is my poncho. Wow. This is the poncho that mom made me. And oh. I wear a lot. It's like a turtleneck poncho. It's a turtleneck poncho. And it's warm and it's just a little bit of warm when you want it. You can put it over top of another jacket or whatever. And it doesn't mess up the clothes you're wearing underneath because it kind of, it's like wearing a blanket, but that's more comfortable. Okay, so why don't I just, uh, so hold your questions for a second. I'm just going to show the Newfoundland video to give us a context. Okay. The bear with me. And that sort of leads us into the, that's amazing. Oh my gosh. I think yeah. She's been busy over the course of, you know, her knitting life. Uh, that poncho though, that took me several months. Yeah. Yeah. One second. There we are. Is it getting better at the share thing? Okay, well, let's, let's see how we make it. Okay. We're going to share the screen. And we're going to share sound, and we're going to. Oh, here we are. Can you see that? Yes. Why is it not? There. Newfoundland, an island of rock possessed by ocean. Having withstood the Atlantic's fury, the rugged shores were battered by new storms, the storms of man. By the late 1600s, tens of thousands of fishermen, mostly from France and England, were making seasonal journeys to Newfoundland the cod. Along these wild shores there were fierce disputes over fishing territory.
Even more frightening, pirates preyed on the hundreds of ships bound for the fishery. On Newfoundland itself, these marauders terrorized undefended fishing stations and tiny settlements. Although isolated on North America's Atlantic fringe, Newfoundland had a history that was marred by European war. These symbols of violence now lie forgotten, but are reminders that this was once bloody ground. The prized cod fishery made Newfoundland a target in times of European war. Over generations, English and Irish men and women established routes here. Fishermen poured into the best harbors. The Beothic Newfoundland's only indigenous people were pushed to extinction by starvation, disease, and murder. Increased English settlement and trade led to the island finally becoming an official British colony in 1825. Its decades as a colony were to be dominated by issues of power, class, and for so many hardworking fishermen, poverty. Through the 1800s and early 1900s, Newfoundland was to experience the growing pains that would lead it to stand free as an island nation. Newfoundland's population in the early 19th century was comprised mainly of people from England and Ireland. Smaller groups came from the French-speaking Channel Islands. The Mi'kmaq, who had hunted here for generations, came from Cape Breton. Many Acadians also came from Cape Breton and the Magdalen Islands. Even Highland and Lowland Scots found their place. To make their livings, Newfoundlanders relied primarily on fishing and sealing. Cod was the undisputed backbone of the island's economy. Every day, fishermen headed out in small boats to bring in their catch. This inshore fishery, as it was called, was the way of life for most Newfoundlanders. Each spring, small fish called capelin spawned near shore and were followed by masses of hungry cod. The fish was unloaded and cleaned on makeshift wharves called stages. The cod had to be processed quickly and accurately. A good crew could handle up to 1,400 pounds of fish per hour. Well, back to our, our regular group of wonderful people. So I just want to give you a background, a bit of background of the people of Newfoundland. I didn't want to 
do 45 minutes of movie. We can do, you can actually find that online another time. And, uh, but it gives you a sense of you know, some of the culture and the people. Again, remember Newfoundland became part of Confederation in 1949. And, but it's quite a range of people. You think of the Hardy people. There's actually a book, um, There Was Never a Better Time, written by a, a good friend of mine. And actually, Joanne, I would know him too, Doug Taylor, who passed actually yeah, about a week or two, a couple of weeks ago. And it was about his uncle and his grandfather who came from Newfoundland to Toronto in the 1920s. And I actually have the book somewhere on my shelf. It reads a bit like a Canadian version of Dickens. And the vivid descriptions of, of life in, in, in Outport, Newfoundland, and the how they sur survived and thrived. And then arriving in Toronto by train, and then taking a streetcar up Young Street, and then going to, uh, I can't remember the name of the, 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 the community along Bloor, where there's a lot of Newfoundland of Earl's Court. That's what it was called. Yes, yes. But again, it gives you a sense of background of who they were and what they could be. So why don't we maybe take a, a few moments if we'd like to ask some more questions of Marie about, so what you, what you, you certainly heard why you, how you started uh, creating and crafting the uh, Newfoundland Mittens. What, what, what kept, you, kept you crafting the Newfoundland Mittens? Well, they're, they're unusual. And they, as Joanne said too, they're heavier than usual. Really the two colors uh, adding to that. And then they also are, uh, there's lots of space in them for your fingers to move. They aren't, they don't feel tight on your hands at all. And everybody that sees them loves them. So I keep making them. <laughs> so, 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 so does anyone in our studio audience have questions for Marie? I definitely want to make some Newfoundland mittens, so I yes. need that pattern. <laughs> and what's what? What's the best? What wool yarn would you recommend? Well, that's that's more difficult to find now than it used to be. I don't like to use all synthetic. Um, I wouldn't mind a sixty forty uh, combination, you know, because you've got the wool definitely gives you warmth. And um, and the, um, the acrylic is good too. But uh, if you go, if you don't, if you can't, like we, I've got to find more yarn, and I'm I'm not even sure where to go. But maybe uh, Walmart uh, and see if they're carrying any. Uh, like this Canadiana is a good brand that um, I've bought lots of time. Um, now the the ones I the uh, the mitts that I made for both of my girls, they, they are so valuable. They really <laughs> share. <them. laughs> That's what I say. So there is a wonderful uh, yarn store. Mm -hmm. um, they have everything you can possibly imagine. It's on Gower Avenue, just off Dawes Road. Oh. I can't remember the name of it, but it's right there. <laughs> I can it's the yarn guy. It. The yarn guy, that's right. And really? that might be somewhere if you can get there. Um, Road trip. Have everything you need. They do, eh? They okay, I'm going to look it up, you guys. Hang on. Yarn <laughs> guy? G-U-Y? -Y? Yes. Oh, for heaven's sake, there it is. And like, that's not that far from where I live, Mom. Not really. Isn't it? Well, let me hang on. No, it's really not. Dawes Road is close to you, yeah, I would imagine. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so the, we, really should, close. we should we should have a, a resources that, that come up in discussions. That would be good. <laughs> no, no. It is. Dawes okay. I wish that I could have been able to um, uh, have you meet my mother. Yeah. Uh, she passed away a couple of years ago, but she used to make amazing, amazing. Um, knitted items especially the uh, feral sweaters right. um, that are knitting the round all in sort of one piece kind of thing oh. um beautiful beautiful uh uh afghans she's she did lots of things and I, it would have been so nice for you two to um <laughs> sit in the same room and be able to you know compare notes kind of thing <laughs> i remember my my experience with sweaters year early on wasn't good. So I started out 
buying yarn to make a sweater I I had I didn't have enough yarn now that's always <laughs> that's <laughs> always a problem so then I had to make the sleeves out of a different um color which can be totally cool like that can be really interesting mm -hmm. so and then another sweater that I made it was of cotton and I didn't realize it's not easy to knit with cotton no it stretched and stretched. Oh, I remember and that. Stretched. Yeah. I and then somebody took it that. apart and read it, and I don't know how she got it to hold uh, like a, the a size yeah. fairly. Mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> <clears throat> so I, that's why I haven't tried that many sweaters. Just so, Marie, down the road, would you ever do a demo of uh, Newfoundland knitting another time? When we can be in person, again. I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Well, you could do it online, even. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Till, till, till we have a cure for all this, I don't think we're going to be in person for a while. <laughs> Marie, this is Sharon. I know you can't see me. My camera's broken on my camera. But I just wanted to tell you that my grandmother was a beautiful knitter and crocheter, and I still have mittens and some pieces of clothing and tablecloths that she's done throughout her life. And it's a wonderful craft. She tried to teach me to knit years ago, but somehow I just couldn't get, get working at it. It is a craft and um, some people can do it and some people can't, but your work is so beautiful. And I just wanted to let you know that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Sharon. Yeah, that's a, no, I mean, Marie, your, your work is, is, I would say, beyond beautiful. Hmm. It's of the power you could open a store in Yorkville and charge Gucci prices, quite honestly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're at the level of, of uh, Chanel, whatever, I mean, I love that film. <laughs> Definitely. So do people have other questions? Because if not, we have, so, so Marie, why don't you introduce your friend? Yes. And how you know each other. <laughs> Shirley Carmichael, and she is fantastic with with uh, craft. crafts. Just craft. Uh, yeah, but she knits too, but <laughs> she does do a lot of crafts. Very That's how I met up with Marie. I met up with her. Uh, my daughter, I asked my daughter to buy me a very simple book for a hat. And she brought me a Newfoundland book that had all these detailed patterns. And I picked one detailed pattern and I knit it and I made so many mistakes and I ripped it out so many times that I got talking to Marie and she's an expert knitter and I am not. And I do all the other things. I've, I've been making prayer shawls for the church and I just rip them off. I knit one and then buy the next lot of wool and make another. And I've knit continually. I think I have about six or eight on hand right now. But I didn't stick with knitting and I wanted to show Marie my Swedish weaving because this is another way Afghan or whatever else you want to make with it. But it starts with, it starts with monk's cloth. I've done it with Ada and Ada is very much finer. And I'll show you what I mean. When I followed a, 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 a Swedish weaving pattern Sweet. and I made this um, baby's blanket. Oh my. And I haven't sewn the edges in, but it gave you an idea of what it was like. See, it's plain on the outside and it is literally weaving. And I loved doing it. Oh my, you could use that for there's my, there's my baby blanket. Oh my. And it's just done by taking one thread as you see, one yarn, piece of yarn, and weaving it. I've got my needles here with me and kneading it, weaving it across. And you can't tell which direction I've gone in. Wow. But I thought it was fun. But I'll show you 
this is this is following a pattern and i'll show you another one and this is the one i always think women should get onto because this is one that you can do um you do have to watch it but um i do it watching tv i do it all the time you um you take a piece of monk's cloth and you sew the edges so that they won't unravel and that's it excuse me sure where do you buy monk's cloth you go to you buy it at any material store but right now um my kids have looked it up a number of places and they found it in toronto very easily but when I go buying monk's cloth, it's like Marie says, the quality is so important because if you get a monk's cloth that's all um, loose and cheap, it, uh, it doesn't hold the pattern as well as, this was, this was a piece of monk's cloth that I found in my property not very long ago, a couple of weeks ago, as a matter of fact, and I did it in one week. Wow. And, and it is a variegated yarn. Oh, I see. And it's a variegated yarn bought at Walmart. And it was an old piece of off color um, material. But this one uh, with monk's cloth, you could buy a yard of material and you could make I made placemats. I made Christmas runners. And this is my latest Christmas. And I'll tell you what I did. I followed the pattern, the pink pattern in the center, starting at this end, and I knit, I, I weave. I weaved it right through and did that as a part of a pattern. And from then on, I didn't use any pattern. And look at how many patterns came out. <laughs> and it makes it so much fun. Huh. And this is a Christmas one. It's beautiful. And I, I think it's lovely. I do too. And, and you have to sew the edges to make sure that they don't unravel. Mm -hmm. um, and this end, one, one end isn't so good. But um, that's my Swedish weaving. So excuse me, Shirley, does a group of women Name. A Swedish weaving. And a piece of monk's cloth. And it comes in all different colors. And this is a, the off white. I've made everybody in my household has a Christmas one. So that's, that's one of my crafts. And that's one that I, as I said, I took a, a week to do that one. And I did it um, a couple of weeks ago. Excuse me again, Shirley. Do the patterns have names? What was that? Patterns have names. The patterns. I brought my my uh, Swedish weaving book. These are my patterns. But you know, the one that I used as a starter in this one is not here. Um, oh my! These are these are Swedish weaving patterns, and um, as you see. Wait, I'll take one out. Okay. I've done this one. I've done most of the patterns on this one. And what they do, and it's and it tells you um, the, uh, the, the measurements of the material and the lengths of the threads, because you, you cut a piece of wool, the length from, from east to west or, or uh, one side to the other. Mm -hmm. And then you follow the pattern down, but the patterns are easy to follow in that you start and you say four over, three down, four over, three down, four over, three down. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and the pattern goes very quickly, you know? And, and once you've got to the middle, you start at the middle and you work to the one end and then you take the thread that you left, the wool that you left in the middle and you go to the other end. Oh, okay. So that's, um, that's Swedish weaving. And these are the patterns that I've, well, I basically use. I have all kinds of them. Crazy. Um, but but this is um, definitely uh, a simple 
a project for anybody once you've got, oh, I love this one. It was just, it's called Twinkle Twinkle. And it just looks like little stars. And it goes from the middle out to the edge, from back to the middle, out to the edge, and it builds up the pattern. Wow. And you can make, as I said, I made this pattern just came by me saying um, one up, one down, one over, two up, and, and wow. it made a pattern. That's incredible. It really? is incredible. I, I thought it was incredible from the beginning. And, and I, as I said, I've made, I've made most of the, um, the patterns in this book. Huh. Anyway, this is, um, this is the baby's blanket. Wait a minute. There's the baby's blanket. That's your the pattern. And it starts at the one side and goes to the other. And this one, this row would start at the side and go down and up and down and up. So it's not, uh, not intricate and not hard to do. In this so, do people have any questions of Shirley? <laughs> You can ask me all the questions I want and you want, but if once you get a piece of monk's cloth and a needle, you're you're on your way. I brought my needles. No, that's another one. I'll show you the needle that that I like best to use because I did one last Christmas. I went to my daughter's in Vancouver and I didn't have my flat needle with me. And I used a round needle. This is the needle that that goes through. Do you see how it, it's flat? Mm -hmm. And it goes through mm -hmm. the and it goes through the material very easily. Mm -hmm. I won't be able to put it through, of course. Oh yeah. There, see how it, it goes. Wait a minute. I'll show you. I should show you in baby cloth. Um, it goes through one, two three and you're pulling a piece of wool on this mm -hmm. and you pull it through and then it says up to and you go up one two and and so on hmm. it's not hard and the other the one that i did at christmas last year was with just a an ordinary blunt blunt um, needle and I used it for a cloth because the inner, and it does the same exact thing as this does, but um, you can get the, the needle going through the, the different slots. But if you want a craft that's um, easy, get, uh, get some monk's cloth and cut it to the size that you want for the pattern in the book or for whatever pattern you want, like placemats and 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 uh, tray covers, that's what I've done. I did all kinds of tray covers for Christmas, and um, and runners. This is a this is a big piece because it happened to be left over from the last time I did, which was maybe ten years ago. Very nice. But anyway, that's my story. Yeah, but you, you've got some more things to show. So I have. I have all kinds of other crafts. Well, let's felter as well. I'm a felter. So once can I can I stay with the Swedish weavy? Do you take orders? <laughs> uh, no. Well, I would. I mean, I I've made them for everybody, but these are my felting pieces. Oh my gosh! Look at the and, little dude with the hand. And the, well, that was just for fun. Oh, I love. That. I made a monster, and I made him with two hands. I Do you know what felting is? No. I bought a bag of wool. Not so much, but tell us, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 um, the bag of wool tells you what you start with. Okay. And the skein, oh, I think I brought a skein. See, it comes like this. It comes in a big roll and you rip it off. You rip it off by by pulling it because once you pulled it, it pulls off like oh. that. So it goes very easily. 
And once you start felting, I've got a felting needle. Felting needles are different and they require a cushion. Um, I've, I've gotten to be a very careless felter, as you, as you can see. I'm not Marie. <laughs> Marie's the precise one and I'm the slap dash one. But a piece of wool like this, folded in half and, and needled, will eventually, because there are little prongs in the end of the needle, you can see them if you're, you cannot see them from a distance, no. I don't think. And, and eventually you've got a piece that, that will hold together, watch and you'll see. Um, can and you, can you guys see what she's doing? Am I holding the camera correctly? Okay, so I'm pushing, tell her I'm pushing what you do. Material and trying to get the little little jagged marks on the end of the wool that I'm working on to hold together, and it eventually makes something. Here's here's an apple that I just I made recently. Wow. And. It started oh God, as a so piece of as, as a piece of wool and I needled it and this is easier to, to show you. But as you needle it, it gets tighter and harder. Really? And these are these are um, little decorations I made. Oh Maybe a cherry too, yeah. Yeah. That's adorable. And I Oh my gosh, there's a pumpkin, you guys. I made a pumpkin. <gasps> Ah, uh, okay. And the pumpkin is, I put a leaf on him and he's, um, he's pretty solid. You can feel him. He looks <laughs> just like a pumpkin. And, yeah. and well, here's a small, minute pumpkin. <laughs> but I, I thought these were good for my Norfolk pine for hanging on to, to decorate it. So I made I made a number of those kinds of things. But That's when I started, I made little, all these tender. animals. And, and that's all it is. It's a piece of wool that you've started like this and you put them together. And I followed this as the ad in the newspaper. And I like him. <laughs> I, I like him. I think he's, uh, no, he's not. He's not he's the, too okay, low the down. camera's up here. But he's a fun one. But um, this is one of the things that they always start with. They with felting. This is uh, this wool, and it's felted. It's felted to hold it together, and then you can write on it or you can do whatever you want with it, and that's a basis. And you can do that with Christmas stuff too. Um, making Christmas decorations with, I don't think I have any Christmas decoration. I have a monster. I love the hand on the monster. The monster. <laughs> I made two hands for him and then I never put the other hand <laughs> on. Just like that he only has and I, I, It's because I do everything plain. This is my granddaughter <laughs> and that's her, uh, that's her winter outfit. <laughs> and I, and I put, and I took it away from her because um, the cats, can take apart oh, this wool yeah. and you can feel how hard this one, this one's really good. Um, and this is my, my grandson. <laughs> and um, this is an elephant that's with a very soft wool. Very soft wool that I, oh I wasn't gosh. able to work very well with, but I did um, play with it and uh, and do the felting and that's all with this basis the the wool so when you buy this the fuzz. Do, you, do you buy a bag full of variety of color i can buy it you can buy it in one i think i brought one um no i didn't put in one um you can buy a one bagger and the one bagger would have this in it okay one color one color, one color, and and this, as as I said, unravels. Uh -huh. Some when I first bought it, 
I bought a red one and I had somebody hold the end of the wool and it went from one end to the, of the room to the other because wow. it's not small amount, uh -huh, but, uh -huh. but it, um, anyway, that's, that's my felting. Um, and that's a job that anybody can take on. See my little, little, this is a different shape apple. Oh, and this is a different so shape apple. Cute. But I just did these very recently. Anyway, that's- And, and um, your Santa Claus? Oh, yes. I uh, recently, and my daughter said to me, mom, you haven't made me anything for my Christmas table. And she's a champion decorator. She, her house is beautiful. And she has a hall table that she keeps decorated, but I don't know whether she'll ever put this up on her hall table, <laughs> but her birthday is next week or this week. Friday, it's the ninth, uh, the seventeenth of November, and this is um, this is what I did. I've made Santa Clauses, big round Santa Clauses, for my other two families. I have three girls, and this is Janet, and Janet just recently went to Weight Watchers, so I told her that this is my Weight Watchers Santa Claus, <laughs> and he, he looked. That's pretty grim, <laughs> and he, and a but he's thin. You see how thin he is, and and he's um and I've been playing with him every night, and I've overworked him, and that's my problem. But anyway, that's my. So is that how he gets thinner? Well, he just gets he get, harder. He's just, he's just felting, and I'm and I'm getting making him thinner all the time, <laughs> and he does he does have. A movement oh, on Oh, he's him. got jointed arms? He, he oh my has, goodness. Uh, he has movable arms and movable legs. And I thought it originally that I'd give it to her with some uh, spirit looking, but uh, I haven't needled that enough. If I fold it like this and needle with a... Oh, you put a it in bag. Bag. Did I put it back in? Okay, I won't take it out. I needle it again and I can needle till till this really stays put. Really? Yeah, that's that, that's how you do it. Wow. But anyway, and and his face I've made about 15 times and I've taken out his eyes a number of times and tried to get them looking properly. But anyway, that's a, that's another craft. And that's another one that anybody working on crafts can do. That's great. Anybody that, that, and Marie listens to all my <laughs> crazy stories about things that I've done. But this was the one that fits with Marie's craft because I have, um, my daughter in Vancouver gave me um, pom -pom things to make pom-poms. And so as I, as I finish and I have a piece of wool I take the piece of wool and I wrap it around here and then I wrap it around the other end. And she also gave me, she's the same one that gave me the pattern book. Mm. She also gave me a pattern book for pom-poms. And so I made last week, oh, I guess I given them all away. I made red, white, and blue ones to celebrate the end of the um, American election. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I did it in trying to get the pattern, some kind of a pattern in the in the pom poms. Yeah. And last night when my here's a here's a red, white, and blue one. Last night when my daughter phoned, she said, "Mom, have you made your pom pom tree yet?" And I said. I've seen pom-pom trees in lots of craft stores and it's about the easiest, easiest um, craft to do. If you have, this is a small one and the other one, the big one is in the bottom. Oh yes. And th this is, this makes this size. Oh, oh because, okay. because we cut them down and trying to make them even. Yes. And 
You see, every time I had a piece of green or white or, or red, I put it on the section and then you cut it. I, I'd have to show you. I brought everything with me, but um, anyway, these are pom-poms and this makes the wonderful pom-pom tree if you get enough of them. And we always, my, my daughter at West always cuts the, the, the strings off. She doesn't like that one. Oh, really? And, uh, and she puts them uh, together in certain patterns. And I've I done- I love this tiny one. This is from the little size, eh? The, that's the little size. Can you guys and see cut, that? Cut to trim, cut to, cut to um, size. Compared with Here's this size. Here's another one that's cut to size. Um, he's a little guy, and that's the end of Marie's wool, my wool, <laughs> my wool, and um, I could show you how to do it, but I, I won't now. Anyway, that's great. That's my that's my crafting. I don't think I brought the. So, so Shirley, thank you very much for that, and just to add that. As you call it crafting, I would call it making. People, people in Ireland use the word makers because what you're doing is- Making, not, not just crafting, but making. Crafting is popsicle sticks. You are way beyond popsicle sticks. Oh, yes. <laughs> sure. yeah. yeah, so that, that's amazing. And, and so uh, before we slide into Oma, any questions? What was that? Oh, he's just wondering he's just if there's wondering any questions, it, questions any, from the group. Yeah, if anybody wants to ask you anything. Oh, okay. Oh, but that's amazing. <laughs> it really is like if you guys could see the little people and the animals like up close they're remarkable i mean it's art this is art well, what I mean. it's, it's not it's, it's not popsicle sticks no <laughs> no it's beautiful beautiful stuff and there's lots of detail here that is just like the shape of the leaves on the the apples and on the the, um, the pumpkin are just, and the nuance of color that she's incorporated into the leaf. It's not just a flat green. It's really, really lovely, really nice. Anyway, it is, it is a, a hobby that I think, this is one that we tried a long time ago with a piece of wire. That has a piece of wire in it and a butterfly, oh. but the butterfly is not, is not very good. Um, oh, but you but can put wire into but it. But it's eh? got wire in it. So so before I forget, so Joanne and I were talking about a virtual one of a kind craft show. And I think what we have in the makings for Manor Road, maybe not uh, before Christmas, but maybe in the new year, January, February, a virtual craft fair using breakout rooms. So to hold that thought. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that could work. Like you just have to, I mean, people would have to be wanting to do it, obviously. But yeah. well, I think that there's such abundance of talent and like yeah we could definitely definitely promote this really really well i think well that's what i i think we I, I, I feel about i feel that any yeah so and, and the proper and they've got the material that can work the pattern and that and and that's where you start i i put the, the as I said, I put the pom poms in at the very last minute because Susan had said, Mom, have you made your pom pom tree yet? <laughs> and I said, Oh, I could tell. I could talk about that because that's about the easiest starter. And you know, I didn't bring any pieces of my wool, but it it's as easy as this, adding adding the wool around the the, the thing and then closing it up and cutting down the center oh, and you've got a pom-pom. Really? And, wow. it, and it's not, doesn't involve any extra, extra stuff. Uh -huh. And I have four of these. I have two small ones and two, no, I have, yeah, two small ones. And, so, and if you want to do it, you so can. So Shirley, we're going to switch slightly to, to Oma now. No, Oma wasn't able to be here, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to show a picture of Oma and uh, bear with me and we'll just uh, Oma is uh, Marianne's mother we call her Oma because that's a German word for grandmother and that's what we call her at Manor Road one second and let me just get a picture up and we got a picture of Oma bear with me okay one second and we're just going to share the screen 
Okay. okay. And can you guys see? Mm -hmm. One second. Now, can you see that? Yes. Good. Okay. I think I figured that out. Okay. So that's Oma and Grace. Grace is her, her granddaughter. And that was, uh, I think her, was it her 80th birthday? Marianne, do you want to weigh in? Marianne's been made busy. Okay. And she was born in Bavaria. Now, now, before we get into to what she what 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 she did, uh, the baking part, I thought I'd show a little clip of uh, the history of Bavaria. Bavaria is actually in Germany, and it's the southeast corner of Germany, and is a very ancient kingdom. And um, Bavarians are Bavarians first, and Germans second or third, just to give you a bit of background. So there's a real pride in Bavaria. And you, you may have, uh, may or may not realize, you have seen one of the famous uh, Lustvanstein, crazy, a crazy king in the 1800s built that, featured in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Okay, that was the word, Lustvanstein is featured. You, most of us have seen, we're of the generation we've seen Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. So let me just uh, line up the video one second and of the brief history of, there we go, and uh, Bear with me and give you a background of share screen. Can everybody see that? This is Bavaria. In this video, I'm yes. going to take a look at the region of Bavaria. Oh, sorry, just stop. Mentioning its evolution throughout time and determining what it is and in what form it exists in current days. Today, the Free State of Bavaria is a landlocked federal state of Germany. At 70,000 square kilometers, it's the biggest German state by land. And counting with 13 million inhabitants, it's the second largest in terms of population. But I think in order to understand the current state of Bavaria, we have to look back at the origins, not only of the state in its current form, but of the very first rulers of the region, because I think all of it has contributed in some way to the current shape and form of modern Bavaria. So let's hop in our imaginary time machine and travel back a few hundred years, actually almost a few thousand. As a people, the Bavarians come from a region north of the Alps, a region which had before been inhabited by the Celts while it was a province of the Roman Empire, first as Raetia and then as Noricum. Obviously these provinces didn't include the exact borders of the Bavarian state, but they were roughly in the same region. They spoke Old High German, but unlike other Germanic populations, they didn't migrate to Germania from somewhere else. Instead, they were formed by the merging of a number of other population groups left behind after the Roman Empire came to an end. The Celtic Boi, the Romans themselves, the Marcomanni, the Alemanni, the Syrians, among others. Their name, Bavarian, means men of Baia, which some say indicates the area of Bohemia, where the boy and the Marcomanni were from, which means these might have been the initial Germanic populations to come together in Bavaria and settle the area. After the fall of the Roman Empire, the region which we today know as Bavaria became a part of Francia, also known as Kingdom of the Franks, the largest post-Roman barbarian kingdom in Western Europe. Francia existed from 481 to 843 AD, and the emergence of the first Bavarian duchy within the Kingdom of the Franks dates back to 555 AD, being incorporated into Francia in the 8th century. Francia eventually turned into the Carolingian Empire, ruled by Charlemagne, and not long after it collapsed. When it did, it was divided into West, Middle, and East Francia. What's important for us right now is East Francia because that's where Bavaria was located. East Francia was divided into four duchies, Swabia, Franconia, Saxony, and Bavaria lasting from 843 to 962. At this time, Bavaria represented itself through the coat of arms of the House of Welf, which controlled it. During some of these years, for instance, 952 to 976, Bavaria's rule extended into other regions, like parts of Austria and almost all the way down to Venice into the Verona region in Italy. In fact, their loss of one territory, 
Ostarici, roughly in this area, which was then granted to the Babenberger family, marks the founding of Austria. So Bavaria is at the origin of that. And this Bavarian duchy is, I think, the origin point for the current Bavarian state. After some time and through a lot of changes, the regions of East Francia transformed into the Holy Roman Empire, or became a part of it, of which the Duchy of Bavaria continued to belong to as well. Interestingly, it is in an internal conflict with the empire that the very well-known blue and white colors became the symbols of Bavaria. Between 1070 and 1180, there was a lot of animosity between the Holy Roman Emperor and the rulers of Bavaria. Eventually, the animosity scaled up into an actual conflict, which the House of Velf lost. Being so, the Emperor, at this time Frederick Barbarossa, removed the titles of Bavaria and Saxony of this house, granting it to the House of Wittelsbach whose coat of arms is the blue and white pattern we all associate with Bavaria. And this royal house ruled the region for almost 800 years until 1918. So right now the year is 1180 and the Duchy of Bavaria is a member of the Holy Roman Empire. Essentially their status remained unchanged for about 500 years. But then during the Thirty Years War in 1623, Bavaria's dukes, were raised to prince electors of the Holy Roman Empire, and therefore the Duchy of Bavaria transformed into the Electorate of Bavaria. In reality, there was no actual change to Bavaria when it changed from a duchy to an electorate, except it had more power and influence within the Holy Roman Empire. Their territory remained unchanged, and it's actually interesting to look at weird changes that Bavaria's territory went through at times. At this specific time, for instance, their domains weren't really pleasant on the eyes of map enthusiasts, with independent islands in the middle of their land and separate territories which they also ruled. Now, I'm going to be totally honest with you right now, the events that took place during this period of the Electorate of Bavaria are just a big mess. The amount of marriages, revolts, wars, agreements and relations between the different princes, houses, duchies and kingdoms is just ridiculously large and complicated. So I'm going to skip all these many small, although sometimes important events and boil it down to this. Bavaria's rule became eventually more and more absolutist on an internal level. They were able to, whether by desire, conquest or inheritance, increase both their territory and their influence, which didn't please some of their fellow Holy Roman Empire members, including at times the Austrians. And now we fast forward to 1792, because someone was about to change up all of Europe. Guess who? That's right, Napoleon. In this year, France's armies overran the Palatinate region under Bavarian rule. In 1795, they entered Bavaria itself and conquered Munich, being greeted by many liberal Bavarians who were against the absolutist rule. Finally, they reached peace with the Treaty of Lunville, losing the Palatinate and two smaller duchies of Zweibrücken and Ulick. However, Napoleon's victory was not a death sentence for Bavaria. In fact, it ended up helping it. In 1803, due to a territorial rearrangement by the French, Bavaria was granted a number of new territories. Here we can see in light green the territory they had before and the dark green line shows its new borders after the land gain, bringing it very close to the current form. A year later, in 1806, the Confederation of the Rhine was created, leading to the end of the Holy Roman Empire. The Prince Elector of Bavaria declared himself king, and this is how the Duchy of Bavaria became the Kingdom of Bavaria. The Kingdom of Bavaria existed from 1806 to 1918. It is during this period, in 1814, that most of Bavaria's current borders were established, when Bavaria ceded Tyrol and Vordalberg to the Austrians and received Aschenfernberg and Wurzburg in return. And then it existed as an independent kingdom for a while. 
After the rise of Prussia to power in the north of Germany, it kept its independence by playing off the rivalry between Austria and Prussia, not becoming part of the North German Federation in 1867, but then joining the German Empire in 1871 after siding with Prussia on a war against France. Bavaria continued as a monarchy within the empire, and it had some special rights, such as an army, a railway service, a postal service, and a diplomatic body of its own. Despite having joined the German Empire in a somewhat peaceful way, a lot of Bavarians have a sense of several national identity up to this day, being Bavarians first and Germans second. This might have to do with the fact that the Kingdom of Bavaria was mostly Catholic, while their, at the time, rulers of Prussia were mostly Protestant. An interesting aspect is that it's the only state in Germany, which today currently calls itself a free state. It has no legal difference, and maybe they're just making a point. And then we get to 1918. After World War I, the German Empire was abolished and a republic was installed, both on a federal level and also locally in Bavaria. The Kingdom of Bavaria came to an end and the current Free State of Bavaria was created. However, a fun fact is that up to this day, no member of the House of Wittelsbach ever formally declared renunciation of the throne. So that is how Bavaria evolved into its current form. It has a unique aspect amongst German states having two official flags of equal status, one with a white and blue stripe and the other with the white and blue lozenges, which is the shield of the House of Wittelsbach. Today, it shares borders with Austria, Czechia and Switzerland. Within Germany, it borders the state of Baden-Württemberg, Hesse, Thuringia and Saxony. You could currently divide it into Franconia, Bavarian Swabia, Upper Palatinate, Lower Bavaria and Upper Bavaria. Interestingly, the geographic center of the European Union is located in the northwest corner of Bavaria. It has one of the largest economies of any region in Germany, or Europe for that matter. Its GDP in 2007 exceeded 434 billion. In 2018, it had the lowest unemployment rate in Germany and one of the lowest in all of the EU at 2.6%. Today, the majority of the population is still Catholic at 50.5%, 18.8% are Protestants, 4% are Muslims, and 267 follow other or no religion. Due to their history and territorial changes, mainly three German dialects are spoken in Bavaria, Austro-Bavarian, Swabian German, and East Franconian German. So that was a brief look at the history of Bavaria as a state and as a region, starting as a province of the Roman Empire, then forming its identity through the merging of several German peoples, existing as a duchy through medieval times, becoming a kingdom, and then a part of Germany. Thanks so much for watching this video. There we go, a little bit of history. <laughs> That, that I mean, it, 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 they, it, I will love the fact that instead of going through the minutia, he says, well, a lot happened. We're just going to move through a couple of centuries. I thought that was very well done. So otherwise it gets stuck. So what I'm going to show now were some pictures taken by Grace of Oma making cookies. Now, why I thought it was very wonderful to feature this. One of the unique features of Bavarian baking, they use vanilla sugar which is, and, and you try to find vanilla sugar, not that easy. And also you can bake the cookies and a month later, they taste as if they're made yesterday, which is unusual for cooking. But sometimes you make cookies and then they go stale the next day. So quite remarkable. And they're very, though they're, they're sturdy, they're not raw, they're, they're, they're still very uh, uh, lovely, to, lovely texture. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull up the PowerPoint that Grace made of, bear with me, and uh, open the PowerPoint, okay, here we go, okay. It's not a long PowerPoint, it's rather, it's, it's a brief PowerPoint, but it just shows some details. And here we are, and going back to, and, okay. Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. One second, I'm just gonna go, 
from the beginning. People still see that? Yep. Wonderful. Okay, so when you look at that cookie, isn't that a work of art? You have essentially two stars overlaying each other with jam in the middle. So again, not, not exactly clear how it was made, but probably, and the fact that you have two stars overlaying each other, I mean, I don't know about you, we just made about 40 dozen Christmas cookies. And you do this with some cookies, those little, those little points, that started, they would break off, right? Mm -hmm. But but that they're sturdy enough, so they stay together. So you almost have to do that when the cookie is slightly cooled, and then you have to place it on top of each other, and then hope it doesn't break. <laughs> Definitely. And one second, let me just, um, and, they're, and they taste amazing. Oh my gosh. And uh, let me, baking with Oma. And Oma is a German term for, for grandmother. And you know what, I, what did I just do? I pushed a button and it didn't do what I wanted. Go figure, one second, I lost the PowerPoint. Where did it go? There, we, okay, we're back at the PowerPoint. That was sort of weird. Why did it do that? Because because that's what happens when you're doing things. Okay, there we go. Can you see that again? It's a baking recipe there. What happened? Again. It's doing weird things. Okay, we'll, we'll try that one more time. My word. Okay, Ellen. Okay. I'm going to... I mean, you know what happens? Wait a second. I'm just going to go back. Oh! request it's doing strange things okay oh i see okay so that's all my uh, kneading the dough okay and then not seeing the you're not seeing the powerpoint okay yeah. we're not seeing it yet okay, okay. Let me go back to the beginning, okay? One second. Let us pause for station identification, okay? <laughs> Sunday morning, you can join us live at the man. okay? <laughs> Bear with me. Um, okay, why did, why did that do that? Bear with me. I'm gonna go back in too. I'm gonna take a small water break. That's a good idea, okay. <laughs> yeah, I drink. Get you anything? Water, maybe? Yeah, I'm fine. I'll just dive into my mother's fridge and find something. There's ginger ale. There's ginger ale. There's a small ginger. Winter, the charwell. Yeah. I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you. Okay, we're back to the beginning. Okay, good. And I'm going to go back into the PowerPoint. I think we should all be having tea and cookies. Or gin and tonic, or whatever you feel. <laughs> Or something like that. But that's something they can't do. <laughs> yeah. We can figure it out. Okay, can you see that? Yes. yes. Good. Okay, so I'm going to try to figure out a way to make this big. Okay, that's bigger, right? Okay. Yes. Now, if I go back to the slideshow from the beginning, can you see it still? Got it. Good. Now I will. I won't do exactly what I did before because clearly whatever I did, I pushed a button. It went into the twilight zone. Let's see if that works. Oh, hold on. Oh, there we go. Got it. Got it. Okay. Oh, okay. Here's the kneading. She's so kneading at. Okay. You see, almost hand kneading, and you know she's using her hand, not a mixer. Okay. And then. And that's hands. And then shaping. And then kneading again, shaping the dough, and then. Uh, and this is the next scene is fast forward. Those, those are both videos you can find. Oh, I didn't know at the beginning. Both those where you show her hand. Those are both videos you can find. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay. How do I do that? Do I just push on it? Oh. These are videos. Oh, here we go. Okay. I know that. I thought they might be. Oh, I request access. 
Oh, her file sharing. Oh. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go back one second and go back and stop sharing. I think I, I think I, I think I know what I need to do. As you can tell, I've never done this with a. Okay, so if I go into, oh, I get it. Okay, I think I'm getting it. While we're waiting, can I just ask Maria a question about that Swedish? Yeah, definitely. Um, have you used things like uh, ribbon thread or anything like that, or do you only use yarn? Like I couldn't tell from looking what what exactly the material is that you're threading through. So she wants to know if you've used ribbon ever, or is it always yarn? I, I couldn't hear the, oh. Yeah, so she's just wondering if, if you can do alternate, like if it has to be wool, or can it be um, for the Swedish knitting? Oh, or for I'm the sure Swedish you could knitting. do it with, uh, with ribbon? fine wool, a ribbon. You ribbon can do it with a fine sure. ribbon, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. You're, as long as it fits through the slot. See the, the um, squares. The spaces are there. Are, are there. You have to follow the squares mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that are there. And and my needle has a little hole, but not a big hole. But I, I it definitely you could pull anything through because you can pull through you can pull through two wool, two uh, different colors of wool of course, yeah. at the same time. So of course you could pull through one piece of ribbon. I've never done it with ribbon. But I've certainly uh, I've fooled around with this one, and that has different degrees of wool too. Mm -hmm. It has um, the the pink one was a thick wool, and uh, I think the the red one was the slimmest. The Once, I'm just going to go ask Marianne a question. Keep talking, okay? Marianne, yourself. Marianne. <laughs> Are you thinking about doing it, Anne? Yeah, I actually am. I, I've never actually used monk's cloth, but I've used, uh, like I've done a lot of like cross stitch and um, other kinds of needlework. And so I think it must be, you know, well, a cloth enjoyable. using yeah. cross stitch is the one that I used last Christmas for Swedish weaving. Used okay. That sounds good. I, I think it would be really uh, like, like I'm just, my mind is sort of running with all the different things that you could make using that. Mm -hmm. um, this you know. That's how I feel about, about Swedish weaving. I can hardly wait to get back to it. Just be creative. I'm sure you could make a bedspread for a bed or a... Um... That, that pattern was not a pattern. And it was just me telling him, telling the stitch to go up or down. Uh -huh. you know? and, it, and it came out um, excitingly. I was ready to start again. <laughs> and I'm already finishing. I didn't have any more. Mom's gone. So remember when you showed it to me? So guys, those of you who've been to this yarn guy place, like, do they have things like the cloth that we're talking about there? Or is it specifically yeah, like yarns? And that he also does sewing machines, stitchers. He's also known as the stitcher guy. Oh. Um, I'm looking up a place, there's something called the Yarn Cafe on Sales, And they have a website and uh, an e-store. And I think they have it, because that's what I was looking for. So, um, and um, yeah, a couple of places. Susan, in there. did you say that's on Ronces Vale? Yeah. And what's the name of it? Let me pull it up again. Die. I think she called it the Yarn Cafe, that one. Oh, yeah. yeah. The Die is the one that's in my neighborhood. Okay. So, so hello, everybody. I think we figured out how to do the video. Let's pause the, the yarn conversation for once. <laughs> We're going to go back to the other video. I think we figured out how to make it work. So Marianne's going to share her screen, and then we're going to hear uh, Maoma live. Okay. Okay. I think it looks like it's going to rain. 
One second, Marianne may be having a bumpy road sharing her screen. One second. <laughs> okay. She's good. There we are. Awesome. Okay, good. Oh, there it is. Okay. Can people hear the sound? Mm -hmm. Good, I can't, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, Anne's saying no sound, okay. Did she share her sound? Hmm. Oh, because her computer has no sound, okay. That might be why. Okay, we could try that. Let's pause again. <laughs> okay, stop sharing on your computer. <laughs> Okay. You come to me. I think Marianne would have to unmute to have the sound come through. Want me to find it for you? Okay. Hi, everyone. Let's go down and go over I need to. I just need to log into my. Oh, you log into your which? My email. Okay, I do that. Right there. Yeah. Talk amongst yourselves. Yeah. Oops. It's, it's... Oh. Thanks for the link, Susan. Just the internet. Okay. There. Sorry, John, just it went away. It went away? It went away. But it won't. Just one word? Just, I just need to get to the internet. So I can okay. Gmail. Okay. There, there you go. There. By the way, I'm really enjoying this topic. Haven't had a good yarn talk in a long time. Yeah. This is this is sort of what I wanted this to be, you know, like um, brainstorming and everybody get together. I think because of the um, pandemic too, probably has brought people back to handwork, don't you think? Oh, yes. Yeah. For sure. You need something to do when you're stuck in the house for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. Oh, gracious, much oh, more sophisticated goodness. than I am. <laughs> so, okay. so I, I feel we're really blessed away. that we didn't get this pandemic 20 or 30 years ago when we didn't have this technology that we have now so that we can <laughs> all connect. True. I think it's everything. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. We got it all in the I'll login as you. Okay. Um, next. And everybody's learning how to handle it. Uh -huh. It's in my Gmail. Yeah. Of course, you need to log in. No bunch of information. Yeah. It's kind of uh, mm. a new world now, I guess. And we just have to learn how to live within, you know, what what we're limited to doing. And, and I don't see it changing very quickly, that's for sure. No. Finding new ways to do things. It just keeps disappearing. I did a, a lot of needlepoint too. Yeah, you did. Sorry, I, did, um, I got to click it. This is dining chairs. There were four chairs, and it was an old suite. So we sold it with the needlepoint on, and that was extra. That was an extra. Yeah. One. So she also did this chair. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? Oh my goodness, mm -hmm. that's. Just delightful. <laughs> I know, isn't it? And I did six dining room chairs. And they're at my house now. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Joanne, I want your chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I have all of the seats covered because 
I had them when the kids were like little and making a mess on everything. And I've just left them there because honestly, even at 14 and 16, they're still making a mess on everything. And your dog. But they're, they're there and they're nicely covered. So there's no, uh, no worries about having to try to figure out how to clean them. I'm just present. You can click on, like shows her hands, you can click on it. Okay. Um, bear it with. Yeah. Oh, so much. Hello, everybody. We're almost there. Okay. And what we got to do, going back into share mode. Okay. Share screen. Good. Can you, oh, can you see that? Yes. Yay. <laughs> oh, there we are. Okay. Okay. 600 grams of flour and 200 grams of sugar. Then we add four packages of vanilla sugar. Then we add 400 grams of butter. Then we add four tablespoons of lemon juice. Then we add two eggs. And now we mix. You mix until you make a smooth dough. And now it has to rest in the fridge for half an hour. Now we cover it up. Mm -hmm. You gotta do the next slide. Next, we get the dough out of the fridge. We put a little bit of flour on the board and we roll it. Here. Then you put parchment paper onto a baking pan. Yes. Then you stamp your shape into the dough and put the, sh the cookie onto the tray. Yeah. Then you gather all the extra dough, spread some more flour, mm -hmm. roll the dough out again. Mm -hmm. you, cu you cut out the shapes and put those shapes back onto the tray. Repeat and take all the excess dough and roll it back onto your tray. Yeah. Cut out the shapes and place them onto the tray. Then place holes into the center of the cookies. When you are done, preheat the oven to 350. Yeah. Remember to keep these cookies blank. When the oven is done preheating, put your cookies into the oven. Then set a timer for 10 minutes. With the extra dough you have, you can continue cutting out stars and putting them, or whatever shape, and putting them onto the tray. Looks like 10 minutes wasn't enough, so we're going to add another 5 minutes onto our timer. Bake until the edges are golden brown. Add icing sugar onto the cookies that have holes in them, and add a little bit of jam onto the cookies that don't. Then place the top cookie onto the bottom cookie, and voila! Finally, package them off, and they're good to go. Oh, love it. Oh, I'm loving that. Well, that was worth the drive to Acton, wasn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Definitely. we got to figure out how to upload that to our website. Let's do this. This is wonderful. Wow. I am so hungry for cookies. <laughs> I, I, I found it. You know what I, really got me? Lemon juice and cookies. You know, I mean, I've, I've made lemon cookies, lemon shortbread, but I've never thought of lemon juice. That's great. Wow. That's, that's probably what... That's a lot. It does seem like a lot. Yes. Yes. It's a, I, 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 want to I wonder if the, the citrus in the lemon or the pectin that would be in the lemon yes. would make them stay firmer. It would probably make them stay fresher longer, too. Like, yeah. Definitely. 
Well, you got to salute the Germans, Bavarians. So not the Germans. <laughs> so, do, so, so as I as I said earlier, we're talking about making and not crafting because this is much bigger than, and I think it's quite wonderful. So I would say we uh, we, we have we've had a wonderful day, and certainly uh, Shirley and uh, Marie, and uh, certainly Oma, even though she's here here with us in spirit, have shared wonderful uh, moments in how to use our hands and create community uh, between uh, what I call the uh, Newfoundland mittens and certainly the Swedish weaving and the felting and the and the baking with Oma. I would say that's mm -hmm. truly remarkable. So kudos to everyone. And what I'm going to do is I'll let, how about everyone wanted to say one one final farewell and then I'll bring our time to a close. Thank you. Thank you very much for everything you done. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Bye, Thank you so Bye. much for showing us your uh, your crafts, both of you. Yes. You did a great job. And um, I look forward to trying out some of the stuff you've shown us. And I really like, I really want some patterns. Joanne, if you can get hold of some patterns um, that we could maybe type up and post onto the website, that would be just wonderful, especially those Newfoundland mittens. Okay, yeah. I'm on it. That's my project. And Next week, our program will feature a, a person who's coming from far away, Greg McKinnon. The archivist for the Toronto District School Board. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Have so much. See you in a couple days. Bye. Bye. I need to stop. Good to see you all. <laughs>